Hi, today on Creation Talk, did life come from outer space? Hi and welcome again. I'm Gary Bates, CEO of Creation Ministries International US, and I'm talking here with Paul Price, one of our staff writers. How you doing there, Paul? Hey. So subject that you and I are deeply interested in, uh, I wrote the book uh, Alien Intrusion, UFOs and the Evolution Connection, which was made into a, a movie a couple of years ago. And in that, I discussed this topic of panspermia. Panspermia literally means life from space or seeds from space. It's based on a uh, actually a Greek term. And there are two types, right? So there's what they call undirected panspermia. So that is the idea that somehow some primordial DNA has floated into the Earth, landed on Earth, or right. as we're going to discuss, has got here in some asteroids or comets that impacted on the Earth and all life generated from that. Uh, that's what we call undirected. And then, of course, there's the directed one, which was highly evolved, advanced space aliens visited the Earth, and we covered this in the movie with, it, with great yeah. animation, and deliberately seeded life here and then have been, you know, overseeing our ev evolution. That's the more interesting version for... Yeah, well, why, for... there's a point, though. Why do people come up with those ideas? You know, why do we say, it's well... Fun. It's fun to talk about, fun to think about, obviously. Well, isn't the, isn't the problem that uh, we're trying to get away in some respects from a biblical creation and the idea that, you know... If, if evolution doesn't work and it's not a satisfactory answer, I mean, scientists still can't figure out really, and I know this is a big statement, and hey, don't write in and say, well, what about the RNA world? Search creation.com because we'd have answered it. But aren't uh, if, if, if evolution, the, the origins of life, is still an intractable problem, by pushing it off into outer space and saying, well, maybe it floated here from elsewhere or aliens created us, is that really solving the problem? Mm, I, I would say it's definitely not solving the problem. This issue has been sort of building for quite a while now in scientific realms, scientific um, communities trying to figure out on a basic genetic level and, and on a molecular level even, how is evolution possible? And they're running up against a brick wall time and time again. Um, I think the majority of the scientific community is still trying to maintain the illusion of solidarity behind their theory of, of neo-Darwinism and, and abiogenesis. But behind the scenes, um, there's lots of indications that uh, changes are on the way, that uh, this, this theory is not holding up with the latest evidence, and uh, changes are going to have to be coming. But the idea of panspermia, which is seen as a solution to that, doesn't solu solve anything because whether it's directed or undirected, how did life evolve out there? Or if aliens created us, who created the yeah. aliens that created us? And that's called the infinite regression yes. problem because you're just pushing, pushing it off into outer space where you can't solve it. But here's something. Recently, and you've written an article on this, the idea of undirected, this is the idea that these primordial seeds from space traveled here in some icy comet, you know, millions or even billions of years ago and seeded the earth. That was a, a view popularized by a Darwinian skeptic, in fact, a, 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 an astronomer by the name of Fred Hoyle. He, he, in fact, said there were so many problems with traditional Darwinism that they couldn't be solved, which is why he resorted to this idea of undirected uh, panspermia. Uh, he was a bit of a pariah in his own uh, community, he was. wasn't he? But uh, he's been resurrected somewhat. <laughs> and this is the article you wrote about. So just explain to us what the premises of, of this, uh, shall we call it, new Hoylean yeah. theory of well, the origin of life. I, I think I'm the first one to coin the term Hoylites, but that's, that's <laughs> what I'm calling these scientists that are following Dr. Fred Hoyle. I'm calling them Hoylites. But we uh, investigated this article because it's it's really interesting and unique among the uh, secular peer-reviewed scientific literature out so there. So this is a peer-reviewed article. It's peer-reviewed and, yeah. uh, and secular. So that's what makes this particularly interesting because this is not an article where, um, you know, you can have, the skeptic can come back and say, well, they just said that because they're biblical 
uh, you know, fundamentalists trying to push their religion. No, these guys aren't even Christians, uh, let alone fundamentalists. So they're not even theists, in fact. Um, so, so tell us what they're, what they're advocating. Yeah, yeah. so the, this article is from 2018, and it's called uh, Cause of Cambrian Explosion, Terrestrial or Cosmic. They're arguing for what Fred Hoyle and his co-author from Sri Lanka, Chandra Wikramazinga, uh, these guys uh, have this term cosmic biology. Uh, as you uh, mentioned earlier, they believe that life was actually seeded on this planet through extraterrestrial means by comets uh, or other foreign bodies actually entering the atmosphere and bringing genetic material or life or what have you uh, to the planet. And uh, one of the things that I think our viewers would be really interested to hear is some certain uh, specific quotes that are really telling from this paper because uh, they really honestly sound to me just like something that could have been written by a biblical creationist Go on, then. and the, sor the sort of things that we do write. Uh, so but, so is this the idea of uh, the, they're skeptical about yeah, Darwinianism. Exactly. Okay. And, and so let's so, make that point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, first quote, modern ideas of abiogenesis in hydrothermal vents or elsewhere on the primitive earth have developed into sophisticated conjectures with little or no evidential support. So that's the first quote. These guys don't believe that life uh, could have come about by random means here on this planet. Um, another thing they say, the transformation of an ensemble of appropriately chosen biological monomers, example, amino acids, nucleotides, uh, into a primitive living cell capable of further evolution appears to require overcoming an information hurdle of super astronomical proportions, an event that could not have happened within the time frame of the Earth, except, we believe, as a miracle. Yeah. So uh, not only do they think it would cause, it would be a miracle for life to come about randomly, but uh, they're also admitting that this would represent an information hurdle, which well, is something yeah. we've, well, of we really we, talk about yeah, a lot. Yeah, well, we, we would agree with that 100%. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. All right, so... We just don't agree with their conclusions, big, where, where they take it, you know. Exactly. So we've got this big preamble. So tell us, you've coined them as uh, Hoylites. Hoylites, yeah. And that's what these guys are. Now tell us why. Well, uh, you've written the article. Tell us why these guys are Hoylites. So they're Darwin, Darwinian skeptics. They're basically saying the odds of life evolving, you know, in these hydrothermal vents in the Earth or by any other means is basically impossible. So yeah. it's not the God of the Bible. So what else have they got? Well, uh, what they say is at this stage of our scientific understanding, we need to place on hold the issue of life's actual biochemical origins, where, when, and how may be too difficult to solve on the current evidence. So they're saying, we're just not going to go there. However, we think it's, in, it's infinitely more probable that it must have somehow, some way, happened out there in the cosmos and then came here to Earth at some point in our past. Isn't that a bit of a circular argument? Yeah. We, it's impossible for it to evolve on Earth, but it's possible that it evolved somewhere else well, and that, then came to Earth. Actually, haven't they just doubled the... the... Yeah, well, they're, they're kicking the can down the road. No. They're saying, you know what? It's, it's beyond our means to figure this out. There's no way it could have happened by chance here. So let's just take that as a given and let's see where we can right. go. But they're not willing to go, uh, obviously, in the one direction that... So that how do will. they say it gets here? The, the typical Hoylean view is that it's traveled here on some icy comet or something mm, like well, that? Well, it... It's kind of clear as mud. When you read their paper, they're kind of all over the place. So they're hedging their bets. They're hedging their bets, exactly. They, they put forward a whole slew of different ideas. Maybe it, it came just, you know, through dust or through comets. Or a, there, There's one particular idea which um, goes back quite a ways where they've got some idea of an of a icy comet that has a liquid center. Well, that definitely is a Hoylean idea. Yeah. Um, I've got a quote because you brought that up. Yes. Let, me, let me read this quote by Fred Whipple, who's an astronomer, wrote an article, Origin of the Solar System. He was reviewing Fred Hoyle's work, work, and I actually quoted this in my book. He said, I'm charmed but not impressed by the picture of life forms developing in warm little ponds 
protected in their icy igloos from the cruel cold and near vacuum of open space and falling to earth or falling to a primitive earth at speeds exceeding 11 kilometers per second. And if you want to know what visually that looks like, just take a look at this clip. Some have suggested that life on Earth could have arrived by chance from another planet and floated to Earth in some icy comet or meteorite. This is known as panspermia, or almost literally, seeds from space everywhere. But how could organic life survive the incredibly harsh environment of space when there's no oxygen, there's below freezing temperatures, there's harmful radiation, and then just happen to be captured by Earth's gravity as it flew past at tens of thousands of miles an hour and somehow avoided being burned up as it entered the Earth's atmosphere like 48 kilometers per second, and then survive smashing into the planet at supersonic speeds that are fast enough to melt the very ground on impact. So Paul, that, that clip visually demonstrated, I mean, anything entering our Earth at thousands of miles per hour is going to burn up. I mean, think about our spacecraft. They've got special heat shields or on the shuttles. They have tiles to avoid that. And not only that, this impacts the Earth at that speed which, as the clip says, is, is you know, hot enough to melt the ground upon impact. And somehow this primordial DNA or viruses that hijacked, have hijacked some life somewhere survive to become everything we see on Earth because we know natural selection does not produce new information. So basically they've got to keep topping it up. But here's a, there's another problem. They've got to land in the right spot to be suitable for life as well. And this has got to be happening time yeah. and time yeah, again. The, the idea that it would even happen one time is incredible. But the idea that these guys are putting forward is that it has happened repeatedly throughout the history of life on our planet. And that is their explanation for how evolution has supposedly proceeded over time. But didn't they have a, didn't so, they say they yeah, tested this? Yeah, yeah. And that, so, so they, <laughs> they appeal to a few different alleged scientific tests that supposedly give, um, uh, credence to their ideas. One of the ones that they uh, listed was a paper by Thiel et al., uh, who had used a sounding rocket test where, um, you know, they, they send up these rockets and do some experiments, let the rockets come back down and collect the results. And what they did was they painted some DNA on the side in a very heavy concentration right. in, in a few different places. And then they say that uh, once they got the rocket back, they say they were able to retrieve some of it. Well, hang on. If if they're trying to recreate these alleged natural conditions, how did they get the rocket back? I mean, we're talking about a comet crashing to yeah. Earth. This rocket obviously didn't crash to Earth. It had a parachute. So that's well, one. Well, then it's not a fair comparison. Uh, not right? a fair comparison, which, <laughs> you know, the, the authors admit that. They admit that they, they weren't attempting to make it realistic. But then, yeah. I mean, if they weren't doing that, then what was the point exactly? Exa yeah. Well, it's a non-starter. <laughs> <laughs> it's a non-starter. So, I mean, we don't like to ridicule, but I have to be honest, we've kind of uh, a bit aghast at these types of explanations yeah. that, that come up. And I think in some ways, I don't know about you, it shows me that there's a type of desperation. I w yeah, absolutely. It's it's uh, grasping at straws. They're, they, they've hit a brick wall. They're trying to explain things without God. Uh, but as you and I would obviously say, you can't do that. So what is what is going to be the result? They're they're going to have to come up with these these kind of crazy ideas. So uh, a couple of lessons there. Sometimes some very clever people can come up with some seeming technically plausible answers, but sometimes when you look underneath the surface, it's not always as it appears. I think Paul, you uh, nailed it on the head there when you said it's about God. A wise man once said, "There's nothing new under the sun," and all of these very very uh, complex and uh, elaborated ideas are ultimately to explain life without a creator. Thanks for today, Paul. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And uh, as we always say, if you like this, well, hit the like button. And let me challenge you folks. If you like this information, we've had some great comments that people are enjoying this, but it's up to you to share it and get the information out. So, hey, you know people, just share the link and you've done the work of an evangelist right there. And then remember, it's not our job to save people, but we are called to be a faithful witness. So we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining us.